And Kirsty and Lee are actually coming to the US next month, next week. So they're going to be here at my house on April 8th for the eclipse. And then we're doing a tracking evaluation in Ohio. And then I'm not sure what their other plans are, but um, those going to uh, South Africa are going to really enjoy. All right. So reading, track, and sign. I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what are we talking about there? Trying to get all the people moved off so I can see my screen. Okay. So what does it mean when we say reading track and sign? So track and sign is an ancient skill. When you were long, long time ago, um, you know, before cars and before buildings and all of that stuff, if somebody walked outside of their, their hut or their cave or wherever they were living and they saw large tracks that were from, say, a saber-toothed tiger or something, they would know to be on alert. Um, if they saw antelope tracks, they would know that they could feed their family if they followed those tracks and, and caught that antelope. So there was a, a need to be very good at this. Um, we've kind of lost that here in the modern world, um, but you can improve your hunting skill if you're a hunter um, and you can they were highlighting potential dangers in the area. And we still can do that if you learn how to read what is going on on the ground. These are bobcat tracks, actually, um, at a place called the Mud Flats that's at the Allegheny Reservoir. So in modern times, um, if somebody has a high degree of skill in track and sign, it improves the accuracy of the wildlife biology field work. So I work for an organization called Tracker Certification, and uh, we certify wildlife trackers. And it's a system that started in South Africa. Kersey and Lee are also very involved um, with the process, and it's been brought here to North America. So by certifying somebody, if you're going to do a wildlife biology field study or something, you can say, I only want level three or four wildlife trackers on this study, because they've shown that if somebody doesn't know tracks well, they can misidentify animals and give false information. If they don't know scat well, um, they can say, oh, that's wolf scat when it's coyote scat. Um, so, you know, really getting good at this skill is a benefit to wildlife biology. Um, it maximizes your eco literacy. But for me, um, you know, my normal job is running an arts organization. So I don't use this in my work. I wish I did, um, but it just enriches a walk in the woods. So when I walk through the woods now, as opposed to maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I can tell what happened there in some cases when I wasn't there. And that's what's exciting to me. I want to know the stories without disturbing the animals and be able to tell who was there and in many cases what they were doing. So my name is Shane Hawkins. Um, I'm a New York State Master Naturalist through Cornell University Cooperative Extension. Um, I work with tracker certification. I'm a board member and also um, take a lot of evaluations that we give throughout the country. And I have a certification through SWAT, which is a Southwest online tracker training. Um, I work with Kersey and Lee at Tracker Mentoring and Original Wisdom. And then I also contribute to Wild Track, which is a non-invasive, they've trained an AI, which is an artificial intelligence, a computer, to take a photo of a track and tell you what the track is, but not only what the species is, but the gender in some cases, because there's sexual dimorphism in a lot of species. So if you have a large track, um, depending on the species, it can, you can tell if it's male or female. So they're using this right now in Africa to study wild rhinos, and they'll go into an area and just take a bunch of photographs of all these tracks of rhinos that they can find. And then that will spit out a report that says, there's five females and six males in this geographic location, and they're not disturbing the animals at all. They're not catching them. Um, you know, normally you'd have to tranquilize them and that can cause some some harm and even death in some circumstances. So this is a non invasive way to monitor wildlife, which is pretty cool. So I take track photos here in New York and um, upload them to the system and it helps train the AI. So that's what I do in my spare time when I'm not doing my normal job. So what is track and sign? So of course tracks, so these are raccoon tracks here on the right. Um, they've got five fingers. And if you're really gonna get into tracking, you wanna learn how many toes each animal has. Um, this is a, a left, left hind and a right front track. And you can learn a lot from the tracks. You know, this animal was walking. It was walking slowly because the hind foot is behind. Um, and if you find a trail, you can kind of tell 
get a video in your head of what was happening when you weren't there. So tracks, trails, so that's just a series of tracks. This is a bear trail. Scat, poop, this is a red fox that I was trailing and found this, so I know who made it. Um, but this is a typical way that a red fox scat looks, and it's it's a healthy sample, we'll say that. It's larger than, than what you would expect. And then dens and burrows. So this is a porcupine den, and they are prolific poopers and horrible housekeepers. So this is all scat. All of this what looks kind of like dirt. It's actually scat from many, many generations of porcupine living in this tree, and it just kind of spills out um, and, you know, makes a mess. Uh, chews. So a lot of animals chew on different things, either for feeding or for marking. This is a porcupine chewing on the bottom of this tree, and I can tell it's porcupine because it's a cross hatch. It's different than how a beaver chews or how a squirrel chews, and you can tell that. So, you know, walking through the woods, this is where a porcupine was, and they were chewing on this for, for sustenance. So they're eating the cambium layer, which is the, the layer right under the bark. Nests, everybody's seen nests. Um, I'm not sure what this nest is. I'm still trying to identify it. So if anybody knows bird nests really well, um, still looking for that one. I think yellow warbler, but still working on it. And then feathers, this is a blue jay tail feather. And when you find a feather, once you learn about feathers, you can tell what part of the body it came from. This is one of the center tail feathers. And I just know that because I know the patterns of the different feathers on a blue jay. So beautiful feathers out there. But then there's also skulls. This is a this is a porcupine skull, actually. And when you find a skull out in the woods, um, you can tell who it is. And that would be a whole nother talk, though. And then beds. This was I was trailing a red fox again, and it curled up on top of this hill and found this perfectly round little cute little bed. And he was there for a long time. You can see how that was melted. Um, you can see his tracks around there. And by elevating himself, he was able to see what was coming and what was happening and could have a safe nap. Um, and that was probably during the day. And then nut chews. So every animal chews nuts in a different way. This is a red squirrel pattern. And you can walk through the forest and find nuts and, and know who had chewed on them. Digs. This is where a skunk had come in looking for grubs, all those little conical shaped holes. That's a six inch ruler. And, you know, you can kind of picture the, the skunk moving from hole to hole and, and looking for food, trying to, to fill up his belly. And then holes. So notice the rulers, very different sizes. Uh, one is in centimeters and one is in inches, but the, the hole on the left is very small. Does anybody know what that hole is? It's a very distinctive shape. So it's a D-shaped hole. Um, it is an ash tree, if that helps anybody. Maura, what is it? <laughs> yeah, Emperor. okay, look in the chat room. You guys yeah. are good. Yeah, oh, good, good, good. So, yeah, it is indeed. You guys are right, the emerald ash borer. Yeah, and unfortunately this is on my property and all my ash trees are dying and falling whenever there's a windstorm. So. Um, emerald ash borer, so you can you can know that that's happening in your forest if you know what the what the hole is like. On the right is a larger hole, an inch, and it's very clean on the outside, which is very indicative of chipmunk. So that's a chipmunk hole. Lost my cursor here. And then pellets. So down in the lower left, you'll see what looks like maybe a piece of poo, but it's not. It is a crow pellet. So. You, you may have heard of owl pellets. Sometimes in um, biology classes, you'll dissect an owl pellet and find skulls in there. Um, many birds pellet. So in fact, most birds pellet. And this crow was eating all kinds of berries and seeds and, and things with pits. And this was um, coughed up. It's stuff that they can't digest and it's in the crop. And then they cough it up and leave it behind. And you can find these of all different sizes, all different contents and once you know what to look for, the shape is very um, clearly not scat. You would expect it to be more tapered had it been a scat. Galls. So galls are caused by a lot of things. They're caused by gall wasps. They're ca called, caused by midge flies, um, fungus in some cases, um, and they're formed usually on plants and they turn into some kind of an insect. And this is an spongy oak apple gall wasp. And you'll find these on the ground when you're near oak trees. And uh, they get quite large. 
and they're pretty cool if you open them up. I don't have a picture of one opened up here, but um, the little pupa is kind of suspended by all these fibers. It looks almost like a little matrix in there. It's pretty cool. If you find one, break one open. And then rubs and scrapes. This is a white-tailed deer scraping its antlers. It's a very typical sign in this area, but a lot of animals make rubs and scrapes. Um, and you can tell the different patterns and depending on the height, if it's an elk or a moose, um, or, you know, rubbed with hair, then there's a, there's hogs that you can consider wild hogs, things like that. So, so there's a lot to wildlife track and sign. So where do you look if you're looking for tracks? It's very easy to see them in snow and mud, um, dust and sand. Now, people who are really good at tracking, they can track in just about any kind of substrate. Um, you know, they trail through leaves, through moss, and, and we do evaluations on that as well. Uh, and signs are everywhere an animal exists. So even if you see no animals, you see no tracks, there is sign there showing you the animals were there. So how do you track? Um, be curious, slow down, use all your senses. Sometimes track and sign is by smell. Sometimes it's by sight. Sometimes it's hearing, um, you know, and, and touching tracks and, and seeing if you can reach into the snow and feel, you know, are there two cleaves at the front of the track? Then that's a deer. Um, do I feel toes? Things like that. And look for breaks in the baseline. So um, if you were on the call really early, we talked about getting up in the morning and looking out and you have a smooth blanket of snow and then a disturbance. Well, that's a break in the baseline. The baseline is that smooth surface of the snow. The tracks that the animal leaves behind breaks that that pattern. So that's what we're looking for. And whether that's a track or if you're looking at bark on a tree and you see a hole or you see a chew or something like that, you're looking for differences. And then you gather evidence and you can use the evidence to identify what the animals were, um, understand what they were doing and interpret where they were going. Um, you can locate wildlife if you follow the tracks and if you're good at trailing. And then you can just kind of understand what happened when you weren't there. So dirt time, that's getting outside and, and looking on the ground and looking on things. Um, and that is, the, you can learn from books, you should learn from books, but you have to pair it with dirt time. You have to have that experience of following a trail and saying, okay, this um, raccoon track normally looks like this in the book, but now that I'm following this trail in really good mud and I can see every way that this animal is putting their foot down, their hands are a lot like ours, their paws are like ours. So, you know, we can make a track like that or like this or like this, and they can do the same thing. So raccoon tracks are the tricksters and the humblers. Um, we have a saying that you're, you can't call yourself a tracker unless you've been fooled by a raccoon at least a dozen times. Um, their tracks are just very variable. Now the tracks in the upper right are not variable. This animal doesn't have the, op the option of doing that because of the morphology of their foot and their body. Does anybody have an idea of what that might be in the upper right? And you can just unmute and yell it out. What are you seeing? How many toes are you seeing? Yep, I'm seeing four toes on this foot. One, two, three, four. And I'm seeing five toes, one, two, three, four, five on this foot. So this is what's called an understep. So we have a front foot landing and then the animal is moving and putting down their hind foot. Do you notice how all the tracks are very much the same distance apart? And they're very much right next to each other. So this animal has a body structure that doesn't allow it to move. It's kind of stable in what they are. Um, do you see this squirrely line here in the middle? That's a tail drag. So this animal has a tail that drags on the ground when it walks. It walks in an understep walk and it's a turtle. So this is a very large snapping turtle. And once you learn what to look for in a turtle trail, you know, you can pick them out pretty far. They look like tank treads um, wherever you're going. And a lot of animals do not walk like that. They'll, you know, look this way and move their hand, their body this way and, um, you know, shorten their steps or overstep and, and the turtle can't do that. So down in the left, we have an otter track who also has five toes. So this is an otter. Um, this is an otter front foot. We have a hind foot here. See how dropped this toe is. We're going to look at their feet in a moment and you'll be able to see what that looks like. 
And then this giant track over here, does anybody have an idea of who that might be or what kind of animal? Look at your scale. We have three inches. Crane. Good guess. Um, cranes don't have this back toe, but what other large birds would be the similar size to a crane? Great blue heron, yes. Great Good. Blue heron. Okay. Yep. So this is a great blue heron track, and um, they share habitat with otters. So not unusual to see them together, but just kind of a cool photo. So when you're out and you see tracks, you can take photos. There's a lot of um, Facebook groups that are out there. If anybody's on Facebook still, I think that's more <laughs> my generation, but um, for identifying tracks. So you can take a photo. Um, please put scale in there, put a, put a ruler or some kind of um, dollar bill or something that's a, a standard size, and you can post it there and somebody will tell you not only what it is, but why it's that. Um, I'm on moderate several pages online and we answer questions, you know, all week long of what different animals are. So you want to learn the morphology if you're interested in tracking and learn about behavior and life cycles, because their breeding behavior, for example, is much different than the rest of the year. And if you know that it can help you determine what actually happened there. Um, diet and habitat does something eat meat. Does it eat plants? You know, where would it be in order to survive? Um, most animals are just looking for food all the time. So if you know what they eat and what type of habitat, it gives you a better chance of finding that animal. And then last, but probably one of the most important, especially with our snowy areas um, that we both live in, is gates and the preferred way of travel. So some animals trot, some walk, some lope. They can all do all of the gates, but they have a preferred way of traveling. So a cat will typically overstep walk through the environment looking for something to stalk, where a fox is going to trot through most of the environment looking to scare up something so that it can catch it. Uh, and then otters lope. This is a lope, this four pattern here. So knowing what the preferred ways of traveling are, if you find tracks in the snow, you can tell what the animal is, even if you don't have a clear track just by the gate. Not in all cases, but in some cases. So morphology, what does that mean? It just means the structure of the foot. So there are books, there's drawings. You, if you're a good, I run an arts organization, but I can't draw very well. So I take a lot of photographs and I also do a lot of plaster casting. So you find a good track in great substrate and you pour plaster in there, let it dry and harden and you dig it up. And then you have something that looks like this on the left. This is a skunk track. So we have really long claws on skunks. Um, they have five toes. They have this pad here that looks almost like a bear palm pad, and then they have a heel pad also, which always shows up. So, well, most often shows up. So that's um, a skunk and it helps understand when you're looking at a track, what it's supposed to look like. Uh, and then if you see roadkill, <laughs> um, my husband's very indulgent, brings me roadkill all the time, which is kind of weird, but it makes me really happy. So he keeps doing it. This was a porcupine that lost its life on the road. Um, but served to train a lot of trackers. I took a lot of photographs, a lot of measurements, um, and it's helpful for people to be able to see this. Not everybody has porcupines in their area. So if they're really into tracking and want to study, they need to learn from people in other areas. This is a hind foot. I know that because it has five toes, which is typical of this animal. And look at these long claws. So when this animal's walking, you typically just see the tips of the claws and they're so long that it holds these toe bones off the ground. So you don't usually see those. And you just see this big giant pad that has kind of a basketball texture. And sometimes you'll just see that texture. And if you know what it is, you're gonna know that there was a porcupine there. And then the track on the right is my dog's track. Um, it's probably the most common track you're going to find. Uh, they come in all sizes. Dogs can be an inch to five inches. And this track is kind of neat because it's showing a dew claw and it's showing the carpal pad. So if you have a dog or a cat, look at their foot and you see four toes in the, in the front and then they have their thumb, which is their toe one, is higher up on their leg and you can see that and you can touch it. And then in the back of the, of the arm, they have another dot right there. And if you run your hand up their leg, you'll find it and it's called a carpal pad, it's a heel pad. All right, so if you find tracks, you wanna measure them. Measuring tracks on a hard surface is really easy. You just look for the edges over here. That would be the width. And then this would be the length, measuring just the to the edges. 
But if you find a track in mud, like the track on the right, you're going to look for the true track, um, which is the bottom of the track. So you're going to look for this dark section. You don't want to measure up here by the cracks. You don't want to measure, you know, back here because that's just the substrate reacting to the weight of the animal. Um, and that would give you a false reading, which might not fit your tracking books um, because you would be off on measurement. And size matters. So bobcats and domestic cats, we have a bobcat here in the middle and a domestic cat on the right, are very similar in morphology. So their feet are very similar as far as the structure, but size is very different. Um, one and a half inches is the cutoff. Um, one and five eighths in some cases, if it's a really large domestic cat, but anything smaller than, than one and a half inches is typically domestic cat and anything larger is usually a bobcat in our area. In other areas, there might be a mountain lion or something like that, but we don't have them in New York State. Um, so, you know, look at the, the similarities. There are differences. There's more negative space, which we're gonna talk about in a minute on a bobcat track. If it's just a larger foot with bigger, bigger gaps. And then here on the left, we have a coyote track. And again, this is a bit bobcat sized track. So if you're walking through a muddy area, sometimes at a distance, you can tell what animal has been there just by the size. So this is again that um, measuring tracks, just showing where you would measure if you had a really good set. So just find that true track, the bottom of the track and measure the edges. So parts of the foot, we already talked a little bit about this, but we have four toes. Um, so you start numbering always from the inside of the leg. So in most cases, um, canines do not show their dew claw, which is the toe one. So we're seeing toe two, three, four, and five. Now this track, because of the depth of the snow, is showing the dew claw. So that's what this is here. And again, the carpal pad back there. Oh, we labeled them. All right. So those are all the labels. Okay, um, compression shape. So sometimes you don't have a beautiful track. This is a bobcat track on the left, it's gorgeous. Um, sometimes they're not that clear. So you wanna look at the compression shape, which is just the shape on the ground. Um, cats have more of a round compression shape where canines have more oval, especially wild canines. Um, domestic dogs can have a round shape also, which makes it very confusing. And then on the far right, we have a lagomorph track, which in this case, um, lagomorph is just the family of rabbits and hares. This is a cottontail rabbit. And just notice how different the compression shape is for each of these tracks. It is something that if you don't have clarity, you can sometimes tell what the animal is, even without the clear track. Hiding all my words up there. There we go. Okay, so species specific field marks. Each animal, of course, has their own unique characteristics. So you're looking at palm pad shape, um, the size of the toe pads compared to the palm pad, symmetry, if there's a leading toe, um, and the negative space. Uh, so in the middle, we have a bobcat track. See how this toe, toe three, stands out. This is a left track, um, stands out more. If you look at your own hand, your toe three, which is your middle finger, is your longest toe, and that is true of, of a lot of animals. So canines, um, it's not as pronounced, but they're, that is a longer toe. But felines, it's very pronounced, and they have a very asymmetrical track. Um, so if you look at this canine track here on the left, this is a, a coyote track. If you folded it in half lengthwise, just folded it, it would be very similar um, from side to side. This is a left track as well, and I know that because this toe here is a little bit larger, just slightly larger, and the inner toe is a little bit smaller. Um, and then we have, and my cat's joining us, so <laughs> he thinks I'm talking to him, I'm sure. Uh, and then on the far right is, I believe they're gray squirrel tracks, but I don't have scale in there, so red squirrel is a possibility. Um, but if you notice, all their palm pads are different shapes, so canines have a triangular shape. Um, felines have a trapezoid shape, and then things like rodents have these little dots that are their metacarpal pads or metatarsal. Metacarpal is the um, front feet, metatarsal is the hind feet, and every animal has their own structure. So even if you only have a partial track, if you notice any one of these features, 
you can sometimes identify the species um, just based on that. So if you find a track, we get people all the time taking photos saying, I know this is a mountain lion track. I live in Connecticut and it's gotta be a mountain lion, but it has a triangular palm pad. You know, that's usually a domestic dog and they're gonna be the most common tracks and they really don't follow any of the rules. Um, and then we have toe pads. So canines tend to have very large toe pads. Felines tend to have very um, large palm pads. So if you took the toes from the canine and tried to fit them into this palm pad, how many do you think you could fit? Two. Two, two and a half at the most, right? Now, what about the feline track? All of them. All of them, yes. So usually three or four toes will fit in a feline palm pad. And then for the, the squirrels and the rodents, their toe pads and palm pads are, are almost the same size. So you have all these little tracks. These are metacarpal pads. These are the front feet of this squirrel down here. These two dots in the back, um, one is a carpal pad, the one on the far left for the left track. And then one is a metacarpal one, which is their vestigial toe one, their thumb that doesn't really exist. You can kind of see a little bump out um, right here. And that is their vestigial toe one. It's just kind of like a callus, a little tiny bump, but it has a, a palm pad um, and that's right there. So if you find these two dots, it's very indicative of a rodent, um, whether it be a mouse or um, a woodchuck or a squirrel, you know, those two proximal pads or, or um, pads that are in the back of the foot are very rodent like. So there we go. So we fit three, two and a half or so here. Um, and then we could easily fit all four of the, the size of the toe pads in the cat track, uh, the bobcat track. And then again, these are all the same size. So just another thing to look at. And then we also, in addition to, oh, we're doing symmetry now. Okay. So talking about folding this one in half and folding this one in half, if you put a line right through the metacarpal pad, you know, clearly this is not symmetrical and that's something to look for. Cat tracks are not symmetrical and then uh, the rodent tracks are. And then negative space. So canines typically have an X or H shaped negative space. I'll show you H shaped in a moment. Um, but if you can draw an X in a track, that's a really good indicator that it's a canine track. Uh, if we tried to draw an X in this track and we came down, it would bisect the palm pad. Um, we would come down here and there's really no way to make a good X in that track without um, affecting the palm pad. And then in the rodent tracks, we just have this big area, rectangular area. So their palm pads are sitting down, their toe pads are sitting down and you've got this big gap um, where their, their foot is held off the ground. And that doesn't, you don't typically see the toe bones on many rodents. This is what we call an H shaped on the far right. This is my dog's track again, and it could very easily be confused for a wild a cougar track. Um, but if you look at it, there's no leading toe. It's very symmetrical. And just because there's a large palm pad, you know, does not rule out domestic dog. Domestic dogs are couch potatoes. They have really pudgy feet usually, and they, you know, just don't follow the rules. So um, always start with domestic dog and try to rule that out first but this shows how you can't do an X on that cat track. Okay, so this is about negative space. Nope, I think we, we went over all that. All right, so there's more. <laughs> there's more field marks. Claws, is there fur in the track? Do they have a carpal pad or any proximal pads, which are just pads in the back of the feet? Is there webbing in the track? Because there are animals in New York that have webbing, beavers, otters, mink. Sometimes it shows, sometimes it doesn't. But if you see it in the track, it is diagnostic. Um, are the front and hind the same or different? So if you put your hand down in the sand or the snow, and then you put your foot down, hand in snow, um, foot down in the snow, you would notice a very big difference between your front and hind feet. Um, and that is true of many animals, but not all animals. So learning what those differences are can help you get to species if you find tracks on the ground. So again, we have our bobcat track on the left. We have our skunk track on the next slide over, the next picture over. And that I think is the one that I cast for that plaster cast actually. Um, our coyote track is in the middle. We have a squirrel front foot on the at the top. 
And then if you look at the track all the way to the right, what do you notice in that track? X. Yes, there's an X. So we're in the canine family. What else? Fur in the top. Fur, one. so much fur. Um, you see all these striations, all these little lines, that's all fur. So there is one wild canine that lives in New York state that has abundant fur on the bottom of their foot. And they also have, do you see this? Um, it's like a chevron shape here. And it looks like a callus bar in the palm pad. There's one animal in all of Eastern United States that has those features. Does anybody know what it is? For fox. I don't know, red fox? Red fox, yeah. So these are red fox tracks. Uh, there's a front track at the bottom here and you can see that really nice chevron. We can see claw marks, these little tiny little dots here are claw marks. That's something to look for to indicate wild. It's not diagnostic, but it is helpful um, because there are domestic dogs that have very sharp claws that haven't been trimmed. Um, but if you see a squared off claw, it's usually a domestic dog. People cut their dog's nails um, so they're chunky, uh, where wild animals do not have that done and typically have very sharp nails. Up here in the upper right is the hind foot. So notice how the hind foot is so much smaller than the front foot. The palm pad is so much smaller and just narrower. Everything about it is smaller. So if you think of a dog's body, they have a deep chest. Their weight is towards the front of their body. So their back feet are smaller. They don't carry as much weight. Their front feet are larger. Now think of a bear. Think of the structure of a bear. They're very butt heavy. <laughs> you know, their, their heads are small. They do have a chest and a barrel chest, but they get wider as they go. So if you look at bear tracks, their hind feet are much larger. And the same is true of raccoons. And a raccoon is the same kind of body style, you know, just really bottom heavy. So another thing to keep in mind when you find tracks, um, you know this is a canine track because you can draw an X through it. And then you think, okay, which is which is hind and which is front? Oh, I know hind feet are smaller, so this must be the hind foot. Um, and this is a side trot. It's a typical pattern um, where they they just bomb all over the place, just trotting all the time, trotting and loping. Um, one other thing to take into consideration is substrate. So substrate is just a fancy word for what you've stepped in. So it can be sand, it can be leaves, it can be you know, dirt, snow, whatever. Um, all of these tracks have one thing in common. Um, they're all made by the same animal and it's my dog. So I, I watched them be made. So I know that they are, um, they are all from the same animal and yeah. some are hind feet, some are front feet. But if you notice how different each one looks and that depends on the substrate, this one is extremely clear, very fresh. It had just happened. You can see the texture in the bottom of the pad, which is just crazy. Um, here on the plywood, you don't see any of that, but it's obviously freshly made or it would have dried. I watched it dry actually after I took the photograph. Up here in the upper right, this is a track in sand that's several days old. So aging tracks, if you know when the last precipitation event was, it can help you determine when that animal moved through the area. Um, clearly this is very, very fresh. Um, the one that I'm circling with the cursor. And if that had been rained on, you wouldn't see all of this detail. Um, some of these edges would be crumbling in. It would just be softer, not so sharp. Um, the track in the very middle at the top is a very fresh snow track. The track that's a snow track in the bottom row is very old. So just look at the differences. See how crisp and clean the middle one is. Um, the one next to it is older, has been snowed in, obviously. So look for the similarities in this. Um, I do notice that on this toe here, you have this angle. So look for that angle in every track and you can see it in every track. Um, and it's something to look for when you're trailing an animal. So if you're trying to follow the same trail, you can look for specifics in each footprint. So this is his foot, this is a hind foot. Those are all hind foot tracks. Um, on the right, and then this is his front foot. See how much wider and bigger it is? And, you know, clearly he doesn't have to hunt to live. <laughs> doesn't worry about where his next meal is coming from. Um, but he makes big tracks, and sometimes they can look very mountain lion-like, and his size is, is right in line with a mountain lion. Uh, so people do mistake dog tracks very often for other things. So there he is again.
Okay, so this is gate could be a completely two hour talk just to give the intro basics, but these are different animals. I'm just going to tell you what they are and what the gate is. Um, so the first gate you probably would um, recognize most people have seen this. This is a lagomorph uh, cottontail rabbit and they have a front foot going down. So you have front foot, front foot, and then the two hinds. And so the hinds are passing the front feet as it's moving. Uh, and then they jump off of those hind feet and the front foot lands, front foot lands, and the hind feet land. This next one is a mink and they have what's called a two by two bound. So there's actually four tracks in each of, you're seeing two holes, but the front feet are going down. Um, if you think of a, a mink's body, really long and thin, you know, kind of like a slinky, and they their front feet go down and then their front feet pick up and their hind feet land in exactly the same space. So a lot of animals will do this gait, especially in deep snow, but the diagonal pattern is very much a mustelid characteristic. Mustelid is a, fa is a family of weasels. So that is mink and weasels and otters and um, fishers, and they'll all do this gait in certain substrates or with certain speeds. So that is a mink. This is a squirrel, which we saw earlier, and squirrels do the same pattern as a lagomorph, so their front feet are coming down, their hind feet are passing the front feet, landing, and then they're bouncing back up and going all the way up here. Um, and that's typical. Sometimes they will hop, which means that their their front feet will be ahead. Um, and that's more of a flying squirrel thing. But these are gray squirrel tracks because of the size. Uh, and then cats walk everywhere. They can lope, they can run, they can trot, but in general, they like to walk. So this is an overstep walk. We have a front foot coming down and then we have a hind foot passing it and sometimes they'll do a direct register which means their hind foot will land in exactly the same space as their front foot had been and you know you can trail these and and know what to expect on the next set of tracks and you can tell how fast the animals are going this animal was moving very slowly just in a walk the middle one in the snow is a fisher so I think you guys have Fisher up in Finger Lakes. We have a breeding population here at my house on our property. So I see these guys a lot. And this is a four by lope. So this is a slow lope. And we have a front foot, hind foot, front foot, hind foot. And then they're going to the next section. So we have a right front, right hind, left front, left hind. And this pattern is just kind of a diagonal pattern. Skunks will do this, mustelids will do this, um, you know, weasels and fishers do that gate a lot. And then we have a bear trail and they also overstep walk. So they walk most of the places that they go and we have a front foot and a hind foot and a front foot and a hind foot and so on and so on. The next one is also mink. This is a different gait that they use, but this is very common um, with otters and with mink. And there's all four feet. You can see all four feet and they just kind of bounce along um, making those tracks. And then the one on the right is a diagnostic trail. So if you see this track pattern, if you notice the angles of those tracks, so they're alternating angles. Look at the difference between the mink over here. That's also a two by two pattern, but all of the pattern is going the same way. In the raccoon, it's kind of all the way. So they do what's called an extreme overstep walk and their hind foot comes and lands right next to their, their front foot. It's very unique. No other animal in North America does this walk. So if you find this pattern, we have a front foot and a hind foot paired, and we have a front foot and, whoops, front foot and a hind foot pa paired, and so on and so on. And you can tell the speed of the animal. This is a slow walk because the hind foot, which is this one, is registering behind the front foot. All right, Gates is a very complicated thing, so we're gonna move on from that. Uh, one way to really learn the tracks is to look at feet. So I collect foot photos. Um, a lot of, I know a lot of trackers all over the world yeah, just fetish. find roadkill and take photos. Um, I guess before we start doing this, are there any questions? No? Shane, I would like to ask, I, I know I have a number of um, the students in our South Africa class here, I'm curious. Um, if you could share with them some of the commonalities, you know, like um, you, uh, you've mentioned characteristics of canines and and phalanx uh, and uh, mustelids, um, those are going to stay true for them, right? They are, yes, and that's what's so exciting. So 
I have a friend in Sweden that shares tracks with me all the time, and I can typically identify them, even though I've never been to Sweden and I've never seen those animals and they're not the animals that live here just because the morphology is similar. So they have badgers there, but they're European badgers. They're different than our badgers, but the foot structure is similar enough that I can tell that that's what it is. So it's kind of a game we play of me sending North American tracks and the same with Africa. Um, we do a quiz every month in our original wisdom newsletter and there's five African tracks or international tracks even, and then five from North America. So if somebody signs up for the original wisdom newsletter, you can take those quizzes. Um, but yeah, the, the, the morphology of animals um, there's convergent di um, evolution everywhere. So animals are, are developing, but they're, they're still the same type of animal. You know, you have a um, leopard would have a similar track to a house cat, just bigger and a few differences. So uh, South Africa has a benefit of having excellent substrate. So if you're going there, you're going to see tracks and you're going to see clear tracks, which is not always the case here in North America. You know, we have a lot of grass, we have a lot of um, leaf litter. There really isn't much of that there. So Africa is a fantastic place to learn tracking. I'm so jealous that you're all going. <laughs> um, so if you look at feet and study feet, that kind of can trigger you thinking about, well, how do, does this gonna look if this foot flips over and lands on some mud? So this is a front track here. Picture this flipping over and landing here. Um, actually, this is a right front and this is a left front track. So not quite the same, but uh, it just helps you understand if you find a track, what it should look like. So we have front foot here and a hind foot there. Um, and that is a domestic cat. And he was not roadkill. He was laying on my bed when I took this picture. So not all of the pictures are dead animals. Um, <laughs> most of them are though, unfortunately. Uh, this is a bobcat, so same idea, you know, look at the different features. Ooh, we're seeing toe one here, so this is the dew claw, and then we have a carpal pad here, too, on the, the foot on the left. And this is the hind track up here in the upper right. This is the hind foot, so notice how much narrower it is. This is the same animal, um, larger front feet, smaller hind foot. And look how pointy those toes are, but then when they're pressed on the ground, you know, they're not quite as pointy. So that is a bobcat. We do have those in New York State. This is a gray fox. So we have red fox and gray fox here. Um, they're different genuses, actually. They're not related closely at all. Uh, they do have fur on the bottom of their feet, but not in the same way that the red fox does that we'll see in just a moment. So look at the tracks compared to the red fox tracks that we saw before. There's not those, str the striations are missing. Um, these claws are hardly even showing. I don't even see a nib there, but their, claw, their claws, a gray fox, has protractable, semi-protractable claws, so they're, they're restricted from going down to the ground quite often. They can climb trees. They're pretty cool. Um, a little bit smaller than a red fox, a little bit different body structure, uh, but that is a gray fox track, and they're very small. Look at your scale over here. So these tracks are under an inch and three quarters, um, where red fox are typically larger than that. So look at this red fox foot. You can't even see toe pads on the hind foot. And then this front foot, this is the callus bar that we were seeing in the tracks. And if you look at the track itself, look at this beautiful callus bar, um, fur everywhere else, really big negative space in the middle because of all the fur that's here in the foot. These little tiny toe pads are being pushed out to the sides by all this fur. Um, red fox, if you find them in good substrate, are pretty hard to confuse with anything else. So look for that callus bar, look for the fur, and look for being able to draw that X in the track. Coyotes, um, larger than a red fox, usually, not always. And they have tracks usually under, under three inches, anywhere from two to three inches. Um, out west, they're a little bit smaller, so they don't get quite that big, but they have been very successful at moving across the country. They're not native to the United, the eastern United States. Um, they did move here through the Great Lakes and across the country, and now they're everywhere, and they're very successful. Um, you probably right. have them in your backyard, and you don't even know it. <laughs> uh, but if you can flip these tracks upside down, here is the front track and then the hind track. 
Notice how the metatarsal pad, which is the palm pad on the hind foot, hardly even registers. Um, and sometimes you'll just see this dot. So the, the hind foot is on the left. Um, and then they have these little wings that come off here. And sometimes those wings don't even show up. You're just going to see a dot or nothing at all. Um, that's another thing that you can look for in domestic dog tracks. They typically will stay on their palm pads quite a bit, um, you, you know, making their weight. They're usually a heavier weight, of course. Um, again, not missing meals and they'll, they'll rest their, their foot very flat on the ground where wild canines are very toe heavy. So they're walking, you know, more heavy on the front of their foot. Um, it's slight, but once you know what to look for, it is uh, one way to add to your diagnostics to try to determine if it's a wild canine or a domestic. This is a long tailed weasel paw and. Wow, are they different? <laughs> so compared to everything that we have looked at so far, um, look at these little tiny pads in a crescent shape over here. And then we've got toe one, two, three, four, five. Whoops, click the wrong, click too hard. And uh, actually that's a hind foot, I'm sorry. And the front foot is here in the middle. And these tracks look very similar to squirrel tracks, but they don't have those the proximal pads, those two dots, and look at how small that hind foot is. So we have a front foot down here, we have a hind foot here, and then a front foot and a hind foot. So this is a bound. So the animal is landing right front, left front, and then right hind and left hind are taking their place. So, you know, not a perfect register, but a confusing mix of pads, uh, but a lot of things to look for there that would tell you that this was a long-tailed weasel. And we do have those in New York State. Uh, we also have these guys, mink. And if you are near a river or a moving body of water or a lake or something like that, you're, you're typically gonna find these throughout New York State. And their feet are a little bit bigger than a weasel's and they have webbed feet. So sometimes that shows but they, they look like little stars quite often. So this center track is very typical where the claws and the toe pads kind of form these teardrop shapes and it's something to look for. They don't always look like this, but if you find them looking like this, there really isn't another animal that um, looks similar. And if you notice this hind foot, these two middle toes kind of hug each other a little bit and see on the front foot that they're all splayed. It's more evenly splayed. And you can see that over here in this hind foot also, that these center toes are tied up against each other. So that's one way to tell front versus hind. Okay, so we talked about Fisher. They're my favorite animal to trail. If you ever find a Fisher trail and you can follow it, um, it's never boring, it's never the same. They don't follow trails. They just kind of bomb around between different trees and looking for prey and investigating logs and, and walking on top of logs. Uh, I trailed one last weekend and in, in the space of maybe a quarter mile, it had walked across three separate logs. You know, they can't seem to to turn up a chance to balance beam. So uh, these are very successful in New York State. They were um, extirpated for many, many years, and then they were reintroduced to Allegheny National Forest in the early 90s. I think it was 92. And since then, their population has expanded throughout New York State, and now they're found um, they're found pretty much everywhere. So you definitely have them in the Finger Lakes, uh, and these are different tracks. I've only found mud tracks one time. Um, we do have a breeding population here, so that just tells you how much they stay off the regular trails and make their own trails. But if you have snow, um, they're just very active on the ground. So this is a typical pattern that you'll see. So we have a front right foot and then we have a left front, which is underneath here, left hind landing on top and a right hind finishing out the sequence to bound to the next group. So this is a group of four tracks. Then there would be a space and there would be another group of four tracks. And that is a fissure. Next size up in your mustelids, which is the weasel family, are your river otters. So look how crazy his feet are. Um, these little brown kind of callousy looking things are planter pads that are scent marked for scent marking. So every time this animal is stepping down, and many animals have these, um, most animals have these, they're just not as um, clear and prevalent as they are on otters. Otters do a lot of scent marking behavior. They like to 
you know, do this poop dance where they're bouncing their rear end and then they leave a scat and then they'll roll in it and, you know, just kind of really gross scent marking behavior to, to spread their scent all over the place. Uh, they get to be quite large, um, four feet long in some cases. And if you are near a river or a body of water, they're pretty easy to find in a lot of areas. So these are beautiful tracks. You can see the webbing in these tracks. So see this line right here? That is webbing. That is up here. If you're looking at the foot, that is registering on the ground and you're seeing that skin that's that's stretching between the toes to help them swim. So this is a set that I took for a picture of for wild track, which is why my ruler is in um, metric uh, because they're international. And you can see all the morphology. So this palm pad looks kind of feline until you see that it's all separate little pads. So if you look over here on this front foot, you see that there's a, a pad for every toe and then three and four share a pad. So we have toe one, two, three, and four, and five. So five has its own pad, three and four share, two has its own pad, and one has its own pad. And the same thing on the hind foot. So look at how different this hind foot is. Um, front foot is pretty symmetrical, you know, not like as symmetrical as a canine, but tracks wise, if you look at this track in the lower right, pretty symmetrical. Look at this hind track. You have four normal toes and then this wonky one all the way down at the bottom, and that's their thumb. They have a very dropped thumb. So fisher tracks and otter tracks can look similar in different substrates, but fisher front feet are bigger than their hind feet and otter hind feet are bigger than their front feet. So, you know, one way to tell them apart, um, fishers also don't have that webbing and they don't have as dropped of a thumb. So a lot of ways to tell different animals apart once you learn all these specifics about different species. This is a striped skunk and we've seen a plaster cast and we've also seen a track. There's tracks on the right. Um, Skunks are unique in that their their toes are fused. So if you look at this track, this is a front track here. All these three toes are fused at the bottom here, so their foot can't splay. So if you're in mud and you're a coyote and it's really squishy mud, your your toes can spread way far out and make your track look bigger than it it normally would. Skunks can't really do that. So their skunk their tracks are pretty much always going to look like this with their toes in a neat little line. And you could confuse them for rodent track because it has that one, three, one pattern. But then you see this big pad um, that's not the dots that we saw earlier in the squirrel track. And the hind uh, carpal pad is just very, very small. And then actually that's the front foot. The carpal pad on the front foot is very small. Um, so it's this part that's registering. There is this big blocky section, but it's really just the middle that registers. And then on the hind track, you'll often get this rectangular squared off kind of pad with a seam here in the middle. So um, hind feet are a little bit bigger. Skunk tracks in snow are really fun and they have a unique pattern. So that's one of the ones that very often, if you see the pattern, you know it's a skunk because of the size and the pattern. You don't even need to see any clarity of the actual track. Raccoons. Um, so these are both really beautiful, perfect textbook raccoon tracks. But like I mentioned before, raccoons can do anything with their feet. So their tracks do not always look like this. Um, if you look at the tracks in the middle, look how different this front foot looks from this hind foot. Um, but then look down here and we have a front foot on the right and a hind foot on the left. Even these look different. So raccoons can look a lot of different ways. Their hand is very much like yours and you can see how they have a plantar grade, um, which means that they walk on the palms of their, their feet like we do, where another term is digitigrade, which is how cats and dogs walk. They walk more on their toes. Uh, so that is a raccoon, very common. Um, look for that pattern of hind and front paired together and you have a raccoon. Cottontails, they're completely covered in fur. There is no toe pads showing whatsoever, but sometimes in perfect substrate, you will get some clarity. And this is a cottontail right front track. And we have a toe one is down here, toe two, toe three, toe four, toe five and you just can't see any anything in the actual animal's foot that would indicate that. 
on the far right is kind of a neat picture. Um, this was a, I was trailing a red fox and came upon where it all of a sudden burst into some speed. And when I looked, there was a, a cottontail rabbit coming towards the fox, saw the fox, turned around and sped away. Um, so this is the same animal. All of these tracks are made by the same animal. We have two track groups of the animal just hopping along, minding its own business until it saw the fox. And then it turned and it splayed all of its toes. See how wide the foot got? And it took off as fast as it could. So see how different the shape is even. There's this big negative space here. So we have a front foot, front foot, two hinds, and it's launching off into, they can launch 10 feet away from the next track group. But then look at the tracks on the left in comparison. You know, you have front, front, hind, hind, you know, little tiny hop, front, front, hind, hind. Um, really wasn't worried about anything until it saw the fox and then it took off. So that was kind of neat to find and understand what had happened there just by um, reading the tracks. These are really common tracks. If you get out in the snow and live pretty much anywhere in New York State, you're going to find these tracks. So red squirrels, red squirrels are the ones that yell at you when you're out in the forest, um, chatter at you, get really mad that you're, how dare you walk through their forest. Uh, they're great. They have a lot of attitude. They are hoarders, so they create larders. Um, they save all of their their nuts in one place, and then they protect it. And that's what they're doing. They're yelling at you like you're not stealing my food. Um, where gray squirrels are scatter hoarders, so that means that they they'll dig a hole here, bury a nut, dig a hole there, bury a nut, and they remember. It's like 97% that they actually go and find if they live long enough, because um, they're eaten by a lot of things they'll find 97% of these nuts that they've hidden, but a red squirrel does it differently. They have these larders and then they'll, you know, just kind of hoard all their food and, and sit and eat it in one spot where a gray squirrel will just eat here and there um, throughout the whole forest. So these are all gray, uh, red squirrel tracks. And then we have these cool patterns that they make in the snow. If you look all the way to the far right, these are foot and tail drags coming in and out of the tracks as they're bounding across deeper snow. And, you know, people will find these tracks and be like, what made these? Because they're really different than how tracks normally look from a squirrel. Uh, but that is a typical pattern of a red squirrel. And this is our gray squirrel. So gray squirrels, you know, can bound farther. They're larger. Um, their trail width is wider. Um, a lot of ways to tell these guys apart once you learn the morphology. And these are a little bit more less less yelling from the gray squirrels so woodchuck this is our largest ground squirrel and we have them all over the state and they they are hibernators so they're just coming out now um, this is kind of a neat picture here if you look at this front foot and see this little nubbin sticking out that's their toe one um, it's a vestigial toe it doesn't really do anything but it's still there and this uh, dot at the back is the palm pad for that toe and then you have toe two, toe three and four share a pad, and toe four. So this is the front track. And this, with the ruler here, is the front track. This is a very fresh track. Look at that texture. You can see like a fingerprint in these, which is kind of cool. Um, if you notice, this is very asymmetrical. So ground squirrels, because they're diggers, their claws are faced in, where if you look back at this other squirrel, the tree squirrels, their toes are all pointing forward because they're going to be climbing the tree. Um, so you can tell behavior if you go to another country and you see a track that has rodent morphology and the toes are straight ahead, you would consider that that, you know, could potentially be a ground dwelling, ground dwelling squirrel or a tree squirrel, where if you're seeing these curved toes, if you go to California, there's California ground squirrels, their toes are curved in. Um, not a rodent, but a mustelid that digs is a badger. Their feet are turned in. Uh, skunks, feet are turned in a little bit. So, you know, think about what tools does the animal have and what would they use them for? And that can help you get to species as well. So uh, woodchucks typically trot wherever they go, but when they're scared or they're afraid, they will bound. So this is a bounding trail here in the middle, and it's just like a big squirrel trail. We have a front foot and a front foot, and then the two hinds paired together. See this one, three, one morphology, and you can see that here in the hind foot. You have one toe. Actually, this is toe one. One, two, three, four, and five is dropped down again. And then you see that here. And every squirrel track will have that one, three, one pattern. 
so you can kind of start to determine what the species is. Beavers, they are our largest rodent. They still have some rodent morphology, but their feet are just bizarre. Um, their back tracks can be seven inches long, which is crazy if you think about it. Um, the highest weight on record of a beaver is 115 pounds. Uh, you know, they don't often get that size. They keep growing. Um, they don't often get that size because they're trapped and eaten by everything. Um, they must be pretty tasty because a lot of animals eat them. So we have a hind foot here and you can see that webbing, um, crazy webbing. So when they're swimming, they're gonna tuck their front feet against their chest and just paddle with their back feet. If you've ever been lucky enough to be around one where it tail slapped and then dove underwater, that's pretty cool. Um, they do that to warn you and also warn each other. And then their front feet, they are one of the only rodents that has a really developed toe one. So this is their toe one. It doesn't often show in tracks, but holy moly, look how big that is. And you can see that over here, um, you can kind of see a little bit of toe one in this lower right track here. Um, see how they're pointed in, they're pigeon toed when they walk. And often you don't see the front tracks because they're walking along, they're closer together because their body is smaller in the front. And then their hind tracks come and land right on top of their front track. And then their tail drags behind them and just kind of obliterates the whole thing. So it's rare to find a good trail. Take photos if you do. Um, this is a nice trail up at the top here, and we can see all five toes, which is just wild. Normally, you'll only see these outer three toes, um, and sometimes just two toes, and it just looks like a peace sign just going through the mud. <laughs> um, but if you know what you're looking for, you can, there, there's a lot of tracks up there. We've got crow tracks in there, and we've got a goose track. Wow, that's a great picture. Um, and then in the middle, does anybody know what that is? Snake skin tail beaver tail it's beaver tail but doesn't it look like snake skin it's crazy if you look at their tail um it's almost scaled like a like a reptile so this was a haul out uh, we were walking along the allegheny river and a beaver had come out of the water and just laid down and you could see the entire imprint of the beaver and its tail and it was awesome it was a great day <laughs> Black bears, uh, they get quite large. There's never been a documented attack here, I believe. Um, but in other areas, black bears do, um, there are black bear attacks and black bears can kill a person, of course. Um, so, you know, use caution when you're around bears. Um, I don't carry bear spray here, but if I go out west where grizzlies are, I definitely carry bear spray. Um, they're an apex predator, and they may not see you as a regular food source, but um, they're always looking for food, and you are small enough to, to get, so just be careful. Uh, this is a front track in the middle, and you see this big giant carpal dot, which is the proximal pad in the back of their foot, and their feet are backwards from human feet. So if you look at your own foot, your big toe is the one on the inside and then your toes get smaller as they go out. Um, bears have four toes in the front and then their, their little toe is actually on the inside. Uh, so if you're looking here, this is, yeah, I've got to flip it over in my mind. This is a left front track. So their thumb is really small, which is unusual but it's something to look for and then you can tell which side of the body your tracks are from. Uh, and then the hind foot has this big long heel pad. It doesn't always show, but when it does, it's diagnostic for hind foot. They have longer claws on the front foot. There's a lot of different things to look for. And that is our largest carnivore um, on the landscape here in New York State. And then these guys are pretty common. Um, everybody has seen these tracks and you can't really confuse them for anything else because we don't have any other ungulates here. Um, actually, we have moose up in the Adirondacks. Uh, and they, they would be very similar to this, but just much larger. And then we have some elk down in Benzette, Pennsylvania, which is kind of central northern Pennsylvania. There's a herd of elk down there. And I've gone and you know looked for those tracks. And they're very different shaped than this. They're not heart shaped. They're more round and more like two hamburger buns stuck together. Um, and they're much larger than deer tracks. But these guys are all over the place and they range from, you know, brand new fawns being an inch long um, to a buck being upwards of three inches. Uh, and these are doe tracks that we're looking at here. And then if you look to the far right, 
You see those two dots in the back? Does anybody know what those are? Dew claws. Dew claws, yeah. So you can tell which, if it's a front foot or a hind foot, just based on the dew claws. Uh, the hind foot has dew claws that are smaller and they're faced um, forward and they're about a track backwards. Um, if you took a track length and put it you know, after the track, their dew claws are up that high where the front tracks are pointed out and they're just much closer to the hooves. So you can tell what the, the feet are just by looking at the dew claws. So we have all kinds of tracks in that picture. Isn't that beautiful? So just a little bit about tracker certification. Um, Cyber tracker conservation is based in South Africa. So if you guys are going there working with Lee and Kersey, they work with Louis Liebenberg, who created the system. He is a brilliant um, person and, you know, created this system that we are now using in North America. Uh, the point system is very complicated, but um, it's just brilliant. It's the way it's set up. And these tracks, track and sign and trailing happens all over the country and all over the world. There's a very strong European um, cyber tracker group. And we do professional level wildlife tracking and certifications. And I'm doing one here in October. I do one every year in the mudflats of Allegheny. So if you're ever interested in seeing what this is like, um, you can message me or look on trackercertification.com, find out where there is one near you. So yeah, so get outside. <laughs> Any questions? A lot of information. <laughs> you're in the Allegheny. I just want to thank you, Shane, so much. Um, this was really wonderful. Lots of great information. Yeah, sorry, I ran over. I didn't realize it was that long. I guess oh, I that's okay. It was very good. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody anything? have any questions? I have, I have a question. Sorry. Um, have you ever tracked an animal like from tracks itself to finding the live animal at the end? Yes. That must be really crazy. It's pretty crazy and I, I have mixed feelings about it. I typically back trail to prevent that from happening. I think animals have a really hard life no matter where they are and what they're doing. So for me to put tracking pressure on them um, is makes me feel a little guilty. So I did trail a fisher um, and found the fisher, which was outstanding. Um, you know, and, and a coyote, I was I was trailing a coyote and she actually led me all the way back to our tracks in a circle where all of a sudden I was seeing my own tracks with her tracks inside my tracks on top of them. So she was following me at one point. So <laughs> yeah, it is crazy. It's if you are taking a trailing evaluation, your goal is to trail the animal, find the animal, show your group the animal without the animal ever seeing you. And if you don't do that, you get docked points. <laughs> cool thank you very much yes well shane if any if no one has any other questions uh tonight can just want to thank you again for coming and sharing an hour with us this evening um and if anyone on the call thinks of some questions later and would like me to share them with shane and can pass them on yeah, anytime you have my contact information. So great. Have a great day. Thank you class. so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ecology students, please hang on. <laughs> Good night, everyone else. Thanks for chiming on. <laughs>